Cheetahs occur at relatively low densities compared to other carnivores. Cheetahs don't live in prides like lions and are usually solitary with exceptions of mothers with cubs and male coalitions. When animals live at low densities, large areas of land are required to support viable populations. Therefore, cheetahs are far more vulnerable to poaching than other predators. The Cheetah Conservation Fund, or CCF, has called on the Convention of International Trade in Endangered Species, CITES, to reclassify cheetah as an endangered species due to its falling numbers. With only 7,000 cheetahs existing in the wild today, Executive Director of the Cheetah Conservation Fund, Dr. Lowry Marker, said in a statement that if this is not done, we may lose the species during our lifetime. Good evening viewers and welcome to One Exclusive. Now with us in studio this evening is Dr. Lowry Marker from the Cheetah Conservation Fund here in Namibia. Good evening ma'am. How are you? Fine and you? Great to always be with you. And Thank you for coming. Yeah, we appreciate the short notice and the long drive. <laughs> <laughs> now listen Dr. Marker, for those of us who do not understand the precarious position that cheetahs are in in Namibia, um, what do our cheetah habitats look like? Well, cheetahs are found primarily from the area in commercial farmlands, from Vintuk up into near Atasha, some up into the western area of the communal conservancies. There's a few up in the Caprivi area, and the numbers are now growing some down in the southern parts of the country. But um, they are very wide ranging, they have huge home ranges, and they live in a low density. So it's not like you have a lot of them on a farm, they're covering 20 farms in a home range. Our game reserves here in uh, Namibia, Atasha has at the most maybe 50, very low numbers. Our conservancies um, have wide open spaces, which are where animals do roam freely much better, and cheetahs will go where wildlife is. And Namibia is well known worldwide for having uh, large populations of free ranging wildlife and very famous in our country for our conservancies, which allow people to have these integrated systems of wildlife roaming freely and wildlife that is managed on these lands. And that is actually why the cheetah has found a place, a niche in these farmland systems. Um, and Vintuk is known as the cheetah capital, or not Vintuk, Namibia, sorry. Yes. But if we look at the cheetah numbers globally, um, they, they are being challenged. Their habitats are being infringed upon. They are. And this has been a big problem and why we put the International Base of Cheetah Conservation Fund here in Namibia um, now 27 years ago to um, bring awareness, work together with our communities here and maintain, we hope, and stabilize our cheetah population, which we've been able to do um, with the great work with our farming communities here and the government. But with that, we've seen quite a decline of the cheetah population throughout the rest of Africa. Today, there are about 7,000 adult cheetahs found throughout around 23 countries. Sure. And so that's not very many. No, not at all. Between Namibia, where we have uh, possibly up to 2,000 adults, um, into that of Botswana, which has the next largest population, and still Zimbabwe and South Africa, where those numbers are very much lower, Southern Africa has 50% of the free-ranging population left in the world. The next large populations are that of um, Tanzania and Kenya, where there they have more areas for um, cheetahs and wildlife parks, national parks. Throughout all of Africa, the cheetahs, about 80% um, of all the cheetahs are found outside of protected areas. And that's what makes them vulnerable. And with that, we've seen as the human population continues to grow throughout much of Africa and poverty not being affected to the way I think that here in Namibia, we are at addressing our poverty issues and making life better, um, that it is affecting the wildlife numbers outside of protected areas throughout Africa, and that is affecting the cheetah population. Definitely, and um, if we look at the cheetah, the cheetah problem, it's not so much poaching as what it is the relationship between the wildlife and the farmer. Um, touch, tell us about that relationship. Well, our wildlife um, is found free ranging throughout much of um, our country's lands. About 80% of all of our wildlife are found outside of our national parks, which um, means that the people are actually managing their wildlife. 
on areas that are just cattle farm fencing, you've got a lot of migration of the wildlife, and that's the areas where the cheetahs have been primarily found. Um, we've done a lot with the farming community looking at um, combating conflict, so looking at... So why does this conflict exist? Well, a lot of it is still mm. a perceived threat. Yes. Um, and then looking at livestock management, and it's usually calves under six months of age. So looking at calving seasons, looking at actually having um, um, your small stock with a herder or maybe things like livestock guarding dogs that are they're protected then, yes. bringing them in tonight at nights. And so we actually know a lot about livestock management and how to protect. A bigger problem that we're facing and have been facing for a number of years is that of the growth of our game fenced farms. And these game fenced farms don't want any predator inside because those predators are eating their wild game, which is what they're supposed to eat. Yeah. And that's where a lot of the conflict occurs. And um, now some of the game farms are actually making themselves totally predator proofed, which is fine because it leaves everybody out of it. Yeah. And then that reduces the conflict, but when they don't make it completely predator proof, then they're doing a lot of killing as well. So um, I think that we've resolved a lot of conflict initiatives with many of the livestock farmers. But then as we start looking at the movement patterns of wildlife, as wildlife stays into kind of fenced areas, you know, that's also a problem. And then animals like cheetahs have a hard time figuring out, you know, how to move around these big areas. So it's all about, I'm going to say, awareness and sharing the information that we have. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of information in the country on um, predator, farmer, livestock, prey relationships. Let's just talk about this farming problem. Um, so your best bet is to protect your livestock from the cheetah. What happens if you do have a cheetah that has now picked off one or two or three of your calves? Is that the, the point where you call CCF and you guys step in and help? Sure. Um, we very much recommend, if there's a problem, let us work with you. Because we know all the problems. I mean, we've heard so many problems. But we also know all the solutions. And there might be a problem animal. Maybe it's um, you know, an injured animal. We picked up an animal not uh, long ago that had a broken leg. And he was in the middle of somebody's you know, sheep herd and catching, couldn't hardly catch very much because his leg was broken. And when they called and they realized his leg was broken, they, it wasn't all cheetahs were a problem. Yeah. This animal had a problem. If something happens to a mother cheetah and she has cubs that are, you know, look big, eight months old, they look big. They're not on their own until they're about 18 months old. She's still the one hunting for them. If something happens to her, the cubs aren't going to be able to hunt on their own. They will then come in and try to find easy prey small calf or goats or sheep. And so we don't want problem animals. We really, and cheetahs don't want to eat your livestock. They would just, they will prefer wild game. And so it's understanding how cheetahs live. If there's a problem, yes, let us try to help immediately. Um, ourselves, other organizations, the Large Carnivore Association of Namibia, we all work together to work with the farming communities to try to find resolve and share with them the things that we've found through many of the other farmers with our, with our kind of management practices. And with the drought now, have you seen an increase of, you know, this precarious relationship between the farm and the cheetah, or not really? Well, uh, not as much. And what you do see during the droughts is you see um, our wild game numbers weaker because um, they're looking for grasses. And then predators actually play a very important role at that point in time because they're Trying, they're actually eating the weaker animals. Yeah, mm -hmm. And then you've got carrion, so animals that have died, so animals like jackals or leopards are actually eating those. Um, but then what happens as your, um, the rains come again uh, and the wildlife populations are out there, the cheetah and the leopard populations, you get a, actually a um, competition between the different predators as well. And in drought cycles, you see that you've got concentrations of maybe your wildlife in different areas and the predators come in and they actually compete and kill, kill each other. So there's a lot of conflict that goes on within different, you know, a, a cheetah um, group and another cheetah group or cheetah and leopard 
that are that we don't actually understand. Um, most farmers don't understand. We as biologists see this regularly and try to share that as well. That we maybe don't have to interfere as much mm. because the animals are actually sorting themselves. Sorting themselves. <laughs> 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 Dr. Laurie, yeah. now um, say now for instance there's a trouble cheetah on my farm or whatever, and do you guys ever relocate these animals? And if so, what's the process around that? Uh, if the farmers do contact us, we will work with them. All of our different organizations do. We've got criteria that we would look at. Um, ideally, we want to have the animals back where they live. Yes. Um, and so if it's an animal that is not a problem animal, ideally, we work with the farmers to try to put the animal back on their land. And then we'll put a collar on it and try to monitor it with the farmer to show the farmer how that animal is actually living. If it's a proven problem animal, like that animal with the broken leg, <laughs> that animal will not be able to live back in the wild. And it has to then go into a captive environment. Or if they're cubs, those animals cannot go back in the wild. They also have to go into a captive environment. Now, some, we've been able to do some rewilding, um, and that's been in collaboration with organizations like um, Arindi Game Ranch, where the animals are fenced. And that's been a very important research project. Or with the Namib Rand, where we've been able to restock populations in the south of the country where now tourists are coming in and actually seeing cheetahs you know, next to the border of the Knockcliffe Park. And it's a really important system down there, and the predators are important to it. But I think there are misconceptions that um, NGOs like ourselves or you know, Nankase or Africat, that we go in there and we take the animals and release them. <laughs> and those things don't happen. Yeah. We, are, we have very kind of strict regulations together uh, we've worked very closely together from the Large Carnivore Management Association to lay down the criteria and to work together with organizations like NAU and the Farmers Associations. There are oftentimes um, stories that were told from you know 15 and 20 years ago that pop up even today. And we bring those out to NAU too to say we need to really talk more about these things and bring them out in the open. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. We're going to stop for a break. <laughs> Viewers, when we get back, um, we'll still talk to Dr. Larry about the state of our cheetahs. Namibia has the largest remaining population of wild cheetah, earning the nickname Cheetah Capital of the World. However, Dr. Laurie Marker has recently called upon the reclassification of cheetahs as endangered. Some environmentalists argue that the classification is unnecessary, simply a ploy to receive more donor funding for cheetah conservation efforts. Others argue that cheetah is already classified as endangered and that this is a publicity stunt by the CCF, arguing that there are other animals in Namibia who need the protection more. With us in studio to clarify the matter is Dr. Laurie Marker from the CCF. Welcome back, viewers. Um, now, Dr. Lowry, let's talk about why you are actually here today. Um, you are pushing for or a recommendation to reclassify the cheetah on the highly endangered species list. Now, tell us about this effort. Well, actually, it's a group effort of over 50 scientists working together for the last about 10 years, decade, looking at what the cheetah numbers have been doing. And we have a very good idea from our censusing throughout the cheetah range countries that the decline is occurring. So as I said uh, earlier in the program, that our populations now are looking at about 7,000 adult cheetahs throughout Africa. And they are not found in protected areas. Over 80% of them are found outside of protected areas, which is how it is here in Namibia. Now, Namibia is, again, we're special. We are doing a very good job, and we are the model for conservation everywhere. But in most of the other ranges, um, the numbers are at such a decline and not able to be protected that a potential um, endangered status might be very, very important for them. So what we've done as a group of scientists throughout cheetah range countries, working with the governments, presenting what our numbers and figures are to back to the IUCN and the CITES, to have them actually look at this. The way classifications usually are, 
uh, really revolve around animals. You know, they usually have protected areas to yeah. live in. And the cheetah is actually outside of this niche. And so we really are asking to have um, the IUCN look at this in a different way. I don't think it's gonna affect what we're doing here in Namibia, so that classification probably will not be a problem here unless our government says so. So it's not, it's not Namibia in particular, you're calling for regional reclassification. Or a maybe reclassification within some of these um, areas that we've seen a drastic decline. Um, we've seen a decline of the Zimbabwe population in a 15 year period from about 1,700 animals, or actually 1,200, down to about 170 animals. And that's due to the animals were outside of protected areas, and we had land changes, you know, political issues, and all of those. Poaching is, had been rampant in that country. And all of a sudden, that, that population is at a very serious point. We're not there here in Namibia. We are, again, the leader. Um, and in some of the other countries, we've got you know, fragmentation where um, populations are not able to connect. So you've got 15 animals here and 20 animals there and five there. And that makes them very, very vulnerable. So even though the country might have you know, 100 animals, they're broken down and they can't get to each other. So it's an awareness point that we're bringing forward. And this um, paper that's come out, um, which, you know, as papers come out and things happen, um, there is, you know, media picks things up and they pick it up in the ways they hear it or want to present it. And from a scientific standpoint, we're trying to actually make things a little bit clearer that it's, you know, no, you know, especially in the different countries that I work in, and I work throughout the different cheetah range countries, I was just up in Ethiopia, where we've got a huge problem up in that area where there's illegal trafficking of cubs going into, from the Horn of Africa into the Gulf states. Well, there, it is a critical part of problems that are going on. And um, the laws that we've been able to work with have been able to be changed up in the, um, up in the Gulf states where they're now saying, no, private people, no, I read are. up about that. Uh, United <laughs> Arab Emirates said you're not allowed to have, you know, cheetahs or lions or whatever as pets. Yeah. Finally. So a step in the right direction. But that took, yes. that took probably, uh, for, uh, for our work, the last, you know, probably six years or seven years, going in and out, working very carefully with the government, um, with the, we're looking at veterinarian care for those animals that are in captivity because the people who have them don't know how to care for them properly and helping make recommendations. And then that went through CITES, but then the government of um, the UAE made their recommendation back to their people. And so it's really about working together closely with governments. Fantastic. Um, now, when I did some research on the CITES website, they did say that the, what, let me get this pronunciation right, um, Asinonyx jupitus. Ju yeah, <laughs> jubatus. Jubatus. <laughs> um, that it's already on the endangered list. <clears throat> um, so what would your reclassification imply? No, it's on an appendix one. All right. And okay. so with that, um, mm. our population here is called vulnerable. Mm. We have critically endangered populations, for instance, up in Iran, yeah. where there are less than 70 cheetahs there. Um, the cheetahs up in um, Algeria are, and Niger are critically endangered because of the small population yes. sizes. Um, and so the vulnerable might be classified up to the next step in some of these countries that are vulnerable um, that might go to an endangered status. Um, I would assume that we would probably keep our vulnerable status here unless things change. And I am not um, anticipating that our Namibian population would go to a change. Although there will be, I think, um, recommendations that some of the other vulnerable populations may go. I doubt that the Botswana population would go that way at this point either, uh, but there's a possibility that maybe the Zimbabwe population would. And let's talk about that vulnerability. I mean, these are shy animals. We know that they, you know, work in small groups or solitary creatures and they need large pieces of land and expansion or whatever, um, but they are, now, if we compare the cheetah to the rhino, for instance, let's talk about that vulnerability aspect. Are you guys getting a lot of support from government? 
We've had a lot of good support from government over all the years. Um, and with that, it's, um, it's put a lot of policies into place. Again, in this country, private people aren't supposed to be keeping cheetahs. Yeah. Um, that's why we've ended up with a number of cheetahs at our center, because they've been confiscated and brought to us uh, for proper care. Of course, people can get a permit, but you have to go through a lot to hold and care for those animals. Yeah. And so the government spent a huge amount in laying down the proper policies Fantastic. for keeping, and we don't want animals in captivity in Namibia. People come to Africa not to go to a zoo. No. They come to Africa to see our animals living in the wild. And as people come to Africa, the economic um, benefit to our country is huge. Our tourism numbers are growing. And we're a safe country. And we're going to get more and more tourists. And what they want to see is free-ranging wild animals. For the cheetah, since they are not found really in the protected areas, they're found out on the private commercial lands, communal lands, but that also, by seeing free-ranging animals, can bring a lot of economic benefits to the country as well that way. Now tell me, what are you guys doing to ensure that these habitats are being protected? As much as you can. As much as we can. <laughs> well, <clears throat> we yeah. believe very strongly in conservancies. Yes. And so okay. being very active with the Conservancy Association of Namibia and working very closely with NAXO, um, the community-based conservation organization, other organizations like WWF and IRDNC, where we're working to really empower. Um, we do a lot of training in human wildlife conflict re resolution, actually, with the communities to help try to teach people how they can live in harmony with wildlife. So I think that's a lot of it. And allow these large systems to work. We're actually one of the last places on Earth that have large functioning systems. And for everybody who fences a piece of land, if they really, it's gone. And I really need everyone to understand that it's not about, you know, everyone talks about economic gain, but the wildlife is something that is a national heritage. And the economic gain for the future is going to be the health of our wildlife. And our natural resources are, are so very valuable. Definitely. So. Um, now, Laurie, just to close off, if anybody wants to get involved, if they want to put some money behind CCF, do you guys take local volunteers, for instance? I love that. <laughs> yes, we do. Okay, good um, news. We just, and we've got lots of students. This has just been the summer season for our Namibian um, universities, and we've had about 20 students from all different departments of um, University of Namibia, some of the tourism um, colleges, all working together. We take volunteers. We love volunteers. Um, I always think one day we're going to get some of the farmers from Ochi Virongo come out and volunteer with us. <laughs> we have a wonderful group of farmers that we work with throughout our region in Ochi Zandupa. We work very closely ourselves over in the, um, in the eastern communal areas, um, in Herrera land, with um, the different conservancies over there. But there's so much, and I, you know, Namibians even knowing what's going on in Namibia is a hard thing. Uh, we've got craft development programs that we are dealing with, for instance, in Herrera land, which gives another alternative livelihood. Um, we're looking at also that scenario where wild dogs are. Yeah. We're kind of trying to wrap around that if we want these animals, we also have to start looking at maybe some community, um, other aspects of maybe tourism or cultural tourism as well. To give these animals value in the community. Absolutely. And then teach the people how to present those animals um, as their tour guides and things like this. So there's a lot that we do need a lot of help with. We need sponsorship, support, um, and we, uh, we welcome that. And if anyone wants to come up to the Cheetah Conservation Fund, we're open every day. And we've got an education center and a research center. And we will work with farmers anywhere. Brilliant. Now, just to end off, for the naysayers that says the CCF is fighting for, fighting for money, and that's why the cheetah shouldn't be reclassified as endangered, um, what is your word to the naysayers? Um, well, I think I already <laughs> said that, in my opinion, All Namibia right. is mm. not, you know, we're not at that problem mm. at this point. But we must, we must keep our eyes Yes, on we must. And mm. we do need to um, open up those kinds of questions 
and discuss them because conservation is not something that's done um, alone. It's done as a community and it does take an organization who is going to help lead it. And I think that we've done a lot of good in helping guide farmers, work with farmers. We're open to farmers' problems and um, their solutions because Namibian farmers are some of the best in the entire world. And they've actually opened the eyes of farmers everywhere on how to actually live with predators. Brilliant. Dr. Laurie, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. <laughs> That's awesome. all for, uh, from us tonight. SMS your comments to 555. And remember that SMSs are charged at one Namibian dollar. Good evening.